Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us today for our final Q&A session with CSUN President Diane Harrison. My name is Logan Bick. I'm the Sundial's Editor-in-Chief. I'm joined today by the Sundial's News Editor, Orlando Marikin. Hello, everyone. It's been a pleasure doing this weekly series with President Harrison. I just want to thank everyone for tuning in. and I want to thank President Harrison for joining us all these weeks. Good afternoon, everybody. I'm Diane Harrison, the President at Cal State Northridge. Okay, so let's start with the first question. So first we wanted to ask you about the Medicare grant. We know that the deadline for that was extended earlier this week. Students now have until the 22nd, I believe, to uh, get that application in. Uh, I was in touch with William Watkins earlier in the week and he said that some of the requirements and restrictions had been lifted in order to accommodate more students uh, for that grant. Uh, he gave me one example, which was that, you know, before you could have, you could only get the grant twice as, as a CSUN student in your career. But that's been lifted now. Just want to know what other requirements or restrictions might have been lifted um, in order to accommodate more students. Uh, as I understand this, and you spoke really to the expert source, uh, <laughs> just Dr. Watkins on this, but as I understand it, previously a student would have had to have been enrolled in a minimum of uh, six units as an undergraduate and I think three for graduates or certificate students and um, that's been lifted. You just have to be enrolled in any number of units to be eligible for those Medicare grants. Um, some of the, uh, and also be in good academic standing, uh, which means you could not be on academic disqualification. So that's basically the requirements now. Okay. Um, and Last month, uh, we did a story on the, this particular grant, Medicare, and I spoke with Director Brignoni, and she said that on any given semester, typically there's $30,000 to $70,000 in that fund for students. Uh, now, that we've, now that the university has done more uh, fundraising for the, for the fund, how much money is in there today and how much money is there available to students and how many more students have we been able to help? Wow. Well, uh, back up just a little bit. The exact uh, dollar amount that's in that fund uh, is revolving, evolving mm -hmm. and revolving because it depends on who might have uh, applied for aid that particular day or that week. Also, money is coming in as, as it's going out. So it kind of just keeps evolving. For example, uh, Tuesdays have now become nationally a day of giving. So on every Tuesday, you might see your email box fill up with requests from any place that you've ever been involved with asking for money on Tuesday Giving Day. And the universities have, have also taken up that uh, habit, I guess. And so last Tuesday, we, we did a give to our Medicare <clears throat> excuse me, fund, and I think they had over 200 people who donated to that. So again, the, the funds, keep, they, they keep coming in, but they keep going out. Sometimes I think there's a, um, I think the highest uh, figure that we had at one point was a couple of hundred thousand. And uh, again, it just depends on the, the time of the semester. It depends on when students are making requests and, uh, and how many donors are continuing to, to feed uh, that fund. Do you think it will be sustainable for the rest of the semester, um, just based on how many people are applying for it? Uh, probably, yes, because again, there's a big push from advancement to get folks to contribute to that fund. But that said, we're also looking at um, other sources of funding to provide relief, particularly for those students who weren't eligible for CARES. And um, the, the other source that we're looking at is to use some of the um, state, what's called SUG grants, state university grants, for which our um, students who are eligible for, um, our DACA students would be eligible for those, for example. We've kind of talked about this in uh, like the prior weeks and the few times we've talked about um, this, maybe third fund, we could call it, that's separate from Medicare for these particular students that we've mentioned. Um, yes. I just, if you could summarize where exactly we are with raising those funds, have we found people to donate? 
Um, has, have there been any particular challenges? And is the university committed to maybe a particular date or time to like start making them available to students? They're, they're available now. I mean, Medicare is available now and our financial aid office is, is really the group that is working on uh, transferring and using the state university grant uh, money or funds for the undocumented students or you know, who would be eligible for those funds, but not eligible for CARES, if that makes sense. And those are not donor funds. Those are funds that we get from the state. Um, so there, there's a couple of different sources that we're trying to use. The, the, um, you know, the difficulty of relying on private funds is you got you to gotta wait for donors to contribute before you have it. So we want to have some backup uh, in the event that for whatever reason that fund runs out before more people have donated. But so far, knock on wood, our alums and friends have been very supportive and responsive to our request to help out our students. People realize and appreciate that students are really, really struggling right now. So that's the good news. Mm -hmm. So uh, just to make sure, oh, yeah. I'm sorry, go ahead. No, no, I was just saying it's good that people have empathy and uh, appreciation for our students' uh, situations. Yeah, just to make sure that I'm understanding everything correctly. So the Medicare grant fund is what we have now for these student groups. Um, and when we say that we're you know, gonna seek out future funding for these groups, we don't mean to say that there's gonna be a separate fund with a different name specifically for these groups. What we're gonna say is we're gonna continue to get funds through the Medicare grant and make that accessible to these groups. Is, that, am I understanding correctly? Partially, yes. Okay. That is one pot of funds that we want to use for students specifically who are not eligible for the CARES grants. All right. Plus, we have another opportunity to use SUG or State University grant money for um, DACA students. Those are our. Uh, AB 5490. So the state of California says it's okay for us to use those funds for those students and we intend to do that. Okay. We were doing some more research on like how different campuses are kind of responded to this idea of emergency relief and what sort of things they're doing to pull together these funds. And apparently Cal State Fullerton's president and their presidential cabinet has committed or have committed about 10% of their take home salary to donate to these emergency funds. Um, until the rest of 20 or for the rest of 2020. Um, has your cabinet or you thought of doing something similar like this? Uh, we haven't done that on a formal basis, like requiring everybody to do that, or even asking people to do that. Most of our cabinet make contributions to our students all the time, uh, mm -hmm. many different ways and many different forms. But I will certainly raise that issue with the cabinet. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I just remember seeing that and being kind of, I was, I was surprised to see that kind of uh, that commitment come from the whole cabinet. And um, we were just wondering if that's coming from the CSU, if they were kind of um, it, encouraging that from the presidential cabinets or where that was coming from, so. No, that wasn't coming from the CSU. In regards to you and your, uh, your plans for retirement, um, we know you kind of stuck around for the rest of the fall semester. That was your plans um, to deal with this crisis. We're just wondering now um, if you have any plans for your future of retirement. Well, my plan is still to uh, say adios in December, but um, you know, that's what, the best laid plans these days are to maintain uh, adaptation and flexibility. <laughs> So, uh, the, but the plan is to continue until December, and that's true for the chancellor as well as my other president, presidential colleague who is uh, also retiring. Uh, the chancellor just told me the other day that they are planning to resurrect the searches for those positions, including Northridge, in the fall. So, unless something dramatically changes, and change seems to be our middle name these days, uh, that's the plan. I know you're saying you plan to say adios in December, but um, if we have a new president and say the in-person commencement gets postponed to maybe spring or sometime after December, 
do you still want to be there to shake class of 2020's hand? Or not shake their hand, but be there for that commencement? Remember, handshaking is going to be removed probably from our culture for quite some time. Um, but uh, to the extent that I could be there, yes, I would, I would appreciate being there. But um, it all depends on what, what a, when, when the hiring uh, begins, when the search process begins, and, and who it is exactly, and what their current situation is. Everybody's different. And um, to assume that, that um, somebody might be able to start January 1, is a reasonable assumption in most instances, but there are occasions when somebody new coming in asks for a little bit of a, re of a reprieve to, uh, to finish some project or finish out something that's happening at their current campus, if they're on a campus. Um, so we try to be a little bit flexible about start dates, but, but the goal is January 1, clearly. Um, another question regarding the census for 2020. So, uh, <laughs> according to the census website, uh, the CSUN tract has the lowest response rate coming in at 3.9%. Um, we were just wondering on why do you believe that it is such a low response rate and what that would mean uh, for the future? Well, uh, first off, the, the question prompted me to drill into why is that the case? Uh, because I didn't understand it. Right before the um, pandemic hit us and we made this transition, of course, which was what, in mid-March, mid um, we had been working very closely with associated students and our um, Office of Community Engagement and, and Civic Engagement, trying to educate and inform students about the importance of the census and why everybody needed to, to participate or fill it out. And so, um, and then the pandemic hit. And what I have come to understand is that uh, when students are on a college campus and they live in a dorm, they are what is called, they are counted as part of a special group uh, it's like group quarters reporting. So the report is for a larger group. So each individual doesn't have to do it. And apparently about April 1st, the request came in to, to do this uh, electronically, uh, not in person. And, uh, and that request was, I think the deadline to complete that, that was May 2nd. So you had like a month to do this electronic response, right? And during that time, the person who responded for us, whoever that was, and that's irrelevant, it doesn't matter, uh, reported on having 383 residents at that time. Because, guess what? Everybody had moved out. If they had reported, you know, earlier in March, it would have been 3,000 instead of 383. So as a result of our inquiry into this, um, we are going to go back and have our staff contact the census liaison that they have been working with to confirm whether the, that April 1st count should have been the true occupancy on that date or the pre move out census, for example, which would have been 3,000 instead of the 383. So depending on what we discover, that's going to influence our, our response rate for sure. Um, but that was, that was um, upsetting to see that we had not. But once I got, and got through here and understood a little bit better what happened, uh, that seems to be the most plausible explanation, but we'll see. How does the census influence um, the budget uh, for the university? It doesn't really directly influence the budget for the university. What it does is, is that it influences how much the state of California gets from the federal government. And also our representation, for example, because it's based on your population. So how many representatives does California get? We also noticed that the state is projecting a fairly large budget deficit coming in at 54.6 billion, uh, the largest in the state's history. 
Yes. Uh, Gavin Newsom is project or um, planning to revise the budget on May 14th. And then you also mentioned that um, the university would provide an update for the fall semester around May 15th. Um, we're just kind of curious on to see um, what kind of updates students and staff can expect on that date. Well, uh, first off, the date has changed. Uh, we're now looking at May 18th to do a system-wide announcement and individual campuses announcements about the future and, and mostly fall, let's say. Uh, so we're waiting to see what the um, governor is going to do in terms of his uh, May revise. That's a first indication of, of what we may be looking at with respect to our budget. Um, and that may influence a little bit of what we do, but, but um, the expectation is that May 18th, there will be a pretty large scale announcement for the CSU as well as the individual campuses. Large scale on the sense of the budget or the plans for the like um, virtual learning or in-person learning or something of all of those natures? All of those things. Okay. All of those things, but m mostly uh, with respect to what students and families and staff and employees can expect for fall. You haven't asked me about the CARES grant, and I want to give you an update on that because that's pretty remarkable as well. And uh, as of 7 a.m. this morning, we have had over 15,170. <laughs> students who have applied for these grants. And um, we have distributed almost $11.4 million so far. Or pe that's pending. That's how much will be awarded. Uh, yeah, we, we did see that. And I actually had a question planned for that sort of. So that's about almost half of the students who are eligible that have applied so far. Uh, there's a week left for the priority deadline. Um, this might be a simple question, but when we say priority deadline, what does that mean exactly? Does that mean if, if someone were to apply on May 16th, uh, like how does that affect if I apply on May 16th versus the 15th? Will I just get the money later? Is there a chance I won't get the money? No, I think that uh, we're going, flexibility is our new middle name. You might not know that or appreciate that today, but it really is. I mean, our, our intent is to get as much money to as many students as we possibly can. And if there are uh, you know, I was thinking actually just this morning that if I, I were a student struggling financially, I'm doing my classes, I'm facing finals, you know, what, tomorrow, next week, and or my senior projects do or, or whatever else that I got going on, uh, I might be uh, putting aside just for the moment applying for this. I might say, well, I, I'll do that next week. Let me get this paper done and then I'll do it. Who knows? I don't know what that, what that is about. But um, we will be flexible and extending. And, the, and we do not have to spend these funds until December, I think, or maybe it's a year, but I think it's December. Uh, so we still can roll over and still award money to students for, for some more time. It's not going to go away. Uh, maybe just one other follow up. I think you've sort of already addressed this, but um, is there anything else you guys are planning on doing to ensure that um, all the students who are eligible are actually applying? I know you can only do so much, uh, but if there's still people at the end of this who have not applied, what will happen to that leftover money? Well, we will, we will continue to use it uh, as we need, as, as additional student needs. My, my um, and I'm just talking out loud now without having consulted with, with the, um, the team that will help make these decisions, but, but my thinking is that if in fact, for whatever reason, somebody just, maybe they're, I can't account or explain for why a student who might have a financial need not applied. There, there might be a few reasons. One, they don't know about it. I would have that, I would find that a little bit hard to believe, but let's just say 
So we're continuing with our communications out. And uh, yesterday we had a, an extended cabinet meeting, or yesterday, gosh, whenever it was, we had an extended cabinet meeting and I reiterated the need for everybody in that room and the entire university is represented by that group uh, to make sure that if they have any contact with students, to make sure that they raise the issue of the importance of applying for the CARES grants. Just today, our faculty senate president sent out one of her last messages to all of the faculty on campus. And she too said, please encourage your students to apply for the CARES grants. I believe it's on social media. There's a lot of, of um, comments on social media from students who have applied and received their money. So that's a pretty good um, prompt, if you will. I would hope that would be a good prompt uh, for those students who haven't applied to go ahead and do so. But my thinking back to what, what it was is that if for whatever reason we still have funds uh, left at, at the end of this term, for example, there may be uh, student needs that arise in the summer term. There will be student needs that, arrive, that arise in the fall term. And if there's money available, we will continue to provide assistance. As long as the money's there until it runs out. Well, we're, we're at the end of the time, but uh, just wondering if you had any closing thoughts, maybe you wanna you know, end uh, the spell of conferences with. Yeah, I would say that um, I, I appreciate this opportunity to, to talk to both of you and to your audience. And um, I hope that, our, our, that students are, are getting themselves ready for this coming week, the last week. I hope that you take care of yourselves, that you do the best you can in all of your assignments and exams, and that you have a, a, a great week. You should have seen in an email that I sent out earlier today that we're planning a, a Cheers 2020 kind of virtual uh, celebration kind of event uh, for next Saturday. And I hope that um, as many of our graduating seniors will participate as, um, as they want. So I think it'll be nice. Uh, it's not great. It's not anything close to a substitute for a commencement ceremony in person, but it is nice. Great, thank you so much for your time. We appreciate it. Um, stay safe and we'll see you later. All righty, bye.